Aloha nui kako. Welcome to Live from Norlab at Hawaii. I am your host today, Leinani Lozi, and I am joining you from Oahu, Hawaii, which is uh, one of the islands of the state of Hawaii, of course. We have many other people joining us today for our Live from Norlab show. We have, of course, our special guest, Rick Feinberg, who will be presenting 35 years at Cosmic Crossroads. And we'll, of course, ask Rick to please let us know where he's tuning in from when we introduce him a bit later. In our Zoom room, we also have Jamika Marshall and Peter Michaud who are joining us from Hilo, Hawaii. And we are all very excited to be here with you today and to learn a bit more about Rick and the amazing work that he does. So mahalo for joining us. We are going to get started with our usual intro with just a little bit about the International Gemini Observatory, which is a program of NSS NORLAB. Now the Gemini Observatory consists of two telescopes. They are twin telescopes, just like the twin constellation of Gemini. So in Hawaii near the summit of Mauna Kea is Gemini North, and in Serra Pichon, Chile, is Gemini South. The International Gemini Observatory is funded by a few different international partners. These include the United States, Canada, Chile, Brazil, Argentina, and Korea. Now for our news highlight, we have a couple things to cover. Just last week, we had our flagship outreach program, known as Journey Through the Universe. This program is 17 years old this year and has continued to grow each and every year to reach students not only on Hawaii Island, but with partnerships from the Daniel K. Inoy Solar Telescope and the National Solar Observatory is also expanding its reach out to Maui and Lanai. So of course, Journey Through the Universe was all virtual this year. And during one week of programming, we had 35 live sessions in which we interacted with students and teachers via Zoom, and we reached about 5,000 students. So mahalo to all of our amazing presenters, many of whom are pictured here on this slide, who presented about their careers, about their life's journeys, and of course, about the amazing wonders of space and the universe. And for our science highlight we have just at the beginning of this month a new organizational release that came out about maroon x which is a fairly new instrument on the gemini north telescope so this instrument is des designed to look at exoplanets planets around other stars and in particular would like to search for rocky exoplanets so planets that are similar to our own. So its very first science result was presented in this announcement linked here from the beginning of this month, and it covered a newly discovered rocky exoplanet called Jalice 486b. Please excuse me if I pronounce that incorrectly. This is a picture of the instrument here, as you can see sort of the inner workings of it. And the image here is actually a 2D colorized spectra of that planet of Jalice 486b. And with that, we will now, I will now turn it over to our special guest, Rick Feinberg. Mahalo Rick for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Leinani. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I am joining you today from a beautiful Grafton, New Hampshire, which is about halfway up the state on the west side. Uh, the virtual background I'm using is um, not a live view because it's nighttime here, uh, but that is the view out my uh, living room to the mountains uh, with my observatory in the background there, which I will talk about. Um, so let me start my slide presentation. Uh, just confirm that you can see everything. So, um, well, again, thank you to uh, Leinani and Peter and Jamika, uh, everybody at NORLAB for inviting me to join you this evening. Um, I titled my talk 35 Years at Cosmic Crossroads uh, because I've spent my career um, at intersections, intersections between um, 
various different parts of the astronomical community, as you'll see, um, including amateurs and professionals and students and teachers and so on. Um, so uh, let's get started. But I should, I suppose I should uh, mention that I'm currently at the American Astronomical Society uh, and also a senior contributing editor at Sky and Telescope magazine, about which I'll say more in a few minutes. All right, so how does someone end up in a career in astronomy and space? Uh, there's many different paths. Mine was anything but linear, uh, but it started uh, back in 1968 when I was 12 years old. Uh, four things happened that year, uh, all coincidentally the same year. Uh, and from that moment or from that year forward, I knew that I was gonna work in something related to space. So my grandmother and my uncle conspired to get me a small telescope. It was a TASCO. Um, in those days, they were white. Now they're blue. Uh, but it was similar to the one pictured here. I found this book, The Universe from Flat Earth to Quasar, in my middle school um, book fair. Uh, picked it up. Uh, couldn't stop reading it once I started. Um, and that was my real first introduction to the amazing um, you know, the amazing universe, the solar system, the galaxy, and the whole universe and beyond. It was an exciting time because uh, in 1968, uh, the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe had only just been confirmed experimentally and the, uh, with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, pulsars and quasars had only just been discovered. So there was a lot in that book that was brand new and it just was so exciting. At the same time, uh, the film 2001, A Space Odyssey came out. Um, I've lost count of how many times I've seen that movie now. Uh, but of course, the first time uh, left the biggest impression uh, in a big, you know, Cinerama type movie theater in those days. Uh, quite amazing. Um, and then the most significant event was at the end of the year when Apollo 8 uh, took three astronauts to the moon for the first time. They didn't land, but they orbited and they showed us that spectacular photograph of Earthrise. And it was then, I, I had always been interested in science and space, but it wasn't until Apollo 8 that I really believed that we were going to land people on the moon. Uh, so my excitement level, my anticipation level really skyrocketed at that point. So from, from 1968 on, I, I knew I was gonna be involved in space in some regard. Now, I think it's true that many astronomers, perhaps most, probably got into astronomy hoping to become an astronaut someday. Uh, that was certainly true in my case. Um, so here on the left is a picture of Buzz Aldrin on the moon and Apollo 11. Um, and I chose to go to Rice University in Houston once I was finished with high school, um, precisely, well, for two reasons. The, the main reason was because it was in Houston, right? What was the first word spoken from the moon when Apollo 11 landed? Houston, right? That's where the Johnson Space Center is. That's where mission control is. And I wanted to go where the action was. But Rice, um, which is a small private school, uh, it had uh, the country's first space science department. Um, and I knew that I wanted to major in physics or space science or astronomy, um, and I could do all of those at Rice. So I went to Rice. And here's an interesting thing. On their application, they had uh, all the usual questions, you know, why do you want to come write your essay and all this stuff. But uh, they also had a box. It was just a, a few inches square. And it said, put anything you want in this box. So I put this photo of Buzz Aldrin, but I doctored it. Um, I put my face in the helmet. Now, of course, this, this is my current face. The one that I put in there uh, back when I applied to Rice was my then 18-year-old face. And I got in thankfully. So at Rice, I majored in physics, which is sort of the, the, the subject that most people who go into astronomy and astrophysics will major in. Um, when I was a sophomore, I saw a poster on the wall in the physics department advertising an opportunity for that summer uh, to be an undergraduate intern with Project Viking, NASA's uh, first mission to, to actually land on Mars. Um, and the person who was running the undergraduate intern program was none other than Carl Sagan. Now, he wasn't a household name yet. Uh, his Cosmos series didn't run until 1980, and this was 1976. Um, but anybody in astronomy knew who he was. Um, 
and he had made some appearances on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and, and all of that. So he was beginning to, to build a name for himself. Um, so I can proudly say that the that my first paying gig in astronomy uh, was from Carl Sagan, which is pretty cool. Now, that picture on the right is the Viking intern class of July 1976. Uh, that's me. Um, I had a lot more hair then. I had hair then. Um, it's interesting, uh, a lot of the Viking interns went on to, uh, you know, fairly illustrious careers. So uh, Wayne Roberge there, uh, he is another astrophysicist. And uh, David Thompson went on to found uh, the company Orbital Sciences, which created the Pegasus air launched rocket and which is currently uh, sending supplies to the space station on its Cygnus cargo craft. And then uh, this guy right next to me, Ken Carpenter, uh, he's the current project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, and this is just one of the classes. There were four classes that summer, and several of the other uh, Viking interns have gone on to, uh, if I can say it, stellar careers in astronomy. Um, my job on Project Viking was to pay attention to this little gizmo on the end of this arm on the Viking lander. It's the meteorology boom, um, and it created or it measured the uh, temperature, the wind speed, the wind direction, um, things like that. And one of my jobs as the as the uh, undergraduate intern with the meteorology team was to produce uh, daily weather reports to send to the um, to TV meteorologists. So that was sort of my first exposure to, to uh, creating content that would end up in the media um, it was way back when I was 20 years old as a Viking undergraduate intern. So after um, I, after that summer, I uh, needed to find a research project to get involved in so that I could do a thesis, uh, a senior thesis at Rice. And I chose to get involved with this Aurora sounding rocket project. So we built a rocket payload uh, that went up on a rocket like the one pictured at left. It's called a Black Brant. Um, it's a very short flight, only about five or six minutes. Uh, but when there's a, a it's launched from a, a range called Poker Flat in Alaska, uh, as shown on the right. Um, the rocket flies up over the aurora, uh, and it measures the uh, charged particle environment, the magnetic fields, electric fields, and so on. Uh, so I helped actually build the payload um, and test it and make sure that it was ready to go. Unfortunately, I uh, was not able to, to go to Alaska for the launch, uh, but the, the people I was working with the uh, faculty members and the postdoctoral researchers, uh, they went and it was a spectacularly successful flight. Uh, we got a lot of good data. And for my senior thesis at Rice, I wrote up uh, preliminary results on uh, what we learned about uh, the direction and intensity of the particles that were raining down in the atmosphere and causing that beautiful green glow, um, the direction and strength of the magnetic hey, fields is, and so on. Peter, excuse me for interrupting, but I think we're behind a slide, I think. Uh, oh, are you not seeing my sounding rocket? No, oh. we're, stuck on, we're stuck on Mars. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's not good. Um, how about now? Huh, I, no, it's not. not okay, happening. well then what I'm gonna do, uh, we knew that this might happen. Um, I do have a rural broadband, which is not broad by city standards. Um, perhaps Le Leinani can go in and uh, pull up the slides herself. Um, and then- Yes, I can do that. I have okay. your- slides available. So, Great. so I'm going to stop sharing then. Sorry. Thank you for pointing that out, Peter. Your, you, Peter. your, your, your image and sound is fine, which is... Yeah, uh, I don't understand why that happens. But again, I, I have... Uh, well, <laughs> you know how you read about uh, part of the uh, COVID relief bill is supposed to provide broadband for um, rural areas. Yes. So I'm hoping that we'll get, that we'll get to be a beneficiary of that. That's, that's All right, perfect. so this is the sounding rocket that I was talking about. The rocket's on the left, a launch photo of the rocket going up uh, over the auroras on the right, and the payload is in the middle. All right, so uh, you can go on to the next slide. So that was the research I did as an undergraduate. So then I decided to uh, go on to graduate school in astronomy, um, and I chose to go to Harvard. Uh, because I wanted to work uh, with somebody there who I'll introduce you to in a minute, uh, who was doing, um, who was working in a new field in astronomy, infrared astronomy, 
Uh, it's very common now, but in the days, uh, in those days, in the late 70s, it was just getting off the ground. Uh, this is looking at, uh, at the universe at wavelengths slightly longer than visible wavelengths, so infrared beyond the red. Um, so on the left is a photo of uh, the Harvard campus with Boston in the background, and on the right is the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, which is where the astronomy department is housed. Okay, so the next slide. So when you start out in graduate school, you, you take courses for a year or two and you have to support yourself with uh, some kind of uh, teaching or research fellowship. So I got a teaching fellowship and I taught um, in a course called the Astronomical Perspective with the two guys pictured at left, uh, Owen Gingerich on the far left and Dave Latham. They had been teaching this course, the Astronomical Perspective for quite a few years by that point. And it was one of the most popular undergraduate courses at Harvard because it filled the science requirement and it was a really great course because it was um, all about astronomy and space and the history of science and that kind of stuff. Now, Owen um, had, he had a gig writing occasional articles and laboratory exercises in astronomy for Sky and Telescope, which is based in Cambridge, uh, only about 10 minute walk from the Harvard Observatory. Uh, and he invited me to, to uh, collaborate with him on a couple of articles. So here's a picture of uh, in the middle of my first article in Sky and Telescope with my name circled there. Uh, it was a laboratory exercise on the rotation of the sun. Um, and that was my first exposure to, uh, to writing for a general audience and uh, getting published in an actual print magazine that you could you know, buy in a newsstand, which was very exciting. And another project I got involved in was um, uh, President Reagan uh, had commissioned a national commission on space uh, to, to sort of map out a strategy for NASA's uh, missions going into the you know, next 50 years. Uh, this was in the early 80s. Uh, and one of the people on the commission was uh, one of the professors at Harvard. So I, um, because I was so interested in space, uh, I went to this professor, his name was George Field. Uh, he's still with us. Um, and I said, you know, hey, um, if there's anything I can do um, as a grad student, you know, to, to help with this project, I'd be delighted. So in the end, it turned out uh, he had me help uh, write and edit uh, the chapter on the future of space astronomy, uh, which was a, a great experience. Um, so I got very much interested in uh, teaching, writing, and editing while I was still a graduate student. But I had to finish my graduate program. And for that, I wanted, I needed to do a research project. So if you go on to the next slide, this is when I started to get involved in infrared astronomy. Lenani, if you could advance the slide, thank you. So this is a picture that uh, many of you might recognize. It's Kitt Peak National Observatory, which is now part of Noir Lab. Um, if you uh, just click uh, to advance, you'll, uh, you'll circle one of the telescopes. Um, yeah, there you go. That's the uh, Stewart Observatory University of Arizona 90 inch telescope. And that was the telescope that I used at Kitt Peak on multiple occasions. Um, if you go on to the next slide, you'll see another observatory that you probably recognize. Uh, that's Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. If you click again, you'll see um, the Gemini Observatory, uh, Gemini North uh, circle. Now, when I was there in the early 80s, Gemini North wasn't built yet, nor were the Kex, nor was Subaru. Um, so I was using a different telescope. If you click, um, I was using the three meter infrared telescope facility from NASA, all right? So that was the telescope I used. I went up there twice uh, for two different observing runs. And if you uh, click on the next slide, uh, here's pictures of me at the Steward 90 inch on the left and the uh, infrared telescope facility on the right. Um, now I've indicated where the cameras are that we're using. These are infrared cameras and you'll notice that they have very few pixels. Uh, the guy on the far left is my thesis advisor, Giovanni Fazio. And he was the guy who I uh, specifically wanted to go to Harvard to work with. And uh, I was delighted because he had this new project uh, just getting started when I was there which was to develop and test uh, the very first infrared cameras for large telescopes. Well, the cameras were very small and didn't have very many pixels, as you can see. The first one had 20 and the second one had 256. Uh, but up until that point, infrared detectors had single pixels, one detector. Uh, so we were the first uh, to start using an array camera. 
So um, next slide. So, uh, so my PhD thesis was mostly a proof of concept. Uh, we uh, demonstrated that an infrared array camera could work, uh, that it could produce uh, results that were not just comparable, but better than what earlier infrared detectors had produced. Um, we could reproduce uh, observations done uh, in the past, but we could extend them, uh, go much deeper, much further, um, and much more reliably. And that camera that I was using uh, was a forerunner of what ultimately became the infrared array camera on the Spitzer Space Telescope with Giovanni Fazio as the principal investigator or the scientist in charge. And I'm very proud that I uh, helped uh, not only to prove that the technology worked, uh, but I also helped contribute to the proposal uh, that ultimately led to Giovanni's being selected to build and operate that camera. All right, but I knew by the time I was finished with graduate school that I didn't want to stay in research. I enjoyed it, but truthfully, I had figured out that I really liked writing and talking and teaching about astronomy even more than doing the research. So once I finished, I looked around for an opportunity and I actually found out about an opening at Sky and Telescope from a fellow former Viking intern. So you'll see there's connections throughout my career. Uh, things in the past uh, helped me with things in the present um, and presumably will help me with things in the future too. Um, so I found out about an opening at Sky and Telescope and I managed to get hired. Uh, so my first issue was uh, the November 1986 issue pictured on the left, and I stayed at Sky and Telescope for 22 years. And as you can see, the magazine changed quite a bit uh, over that time frame. And if you click again, Leinani, you'll see that I changed quite a bit too over those 22 years. Um, so I could go on for hours talking about what it was like working at Sky and Telescope, but I'm not going to do that. What I am going to say is that um, it was uh, the opportunity of a lifetime um, working with uh, the, the cast of characters that ran the magazine um, uh, was really something I learned so much from them. Uh, it was kind of like going back to college and learning a whole new field. Uh, science journalism uh, became a much better writer and editor as a result, uh, became much more knowledgeable about amateur astronomy as a result. And here I was at the intersection of many different communities. A lot of our authors were professional astronomers, also some amateurs. Most of our readers were amateurs, also some professionals. Um, the public would pick up Sky and Telescope when there was a, um, an, a particularly interesting uh, celestial sight to be seen. So for example, during Halley's Comet in 1985-86, uh, which was actually right before I got there, uh, but the magazine sales shot through the roof. While I was there in, the, uh, in 1997, uh, we had two beautiful comets, Comet Hyakutake and Comet Hale-Bopp. And again, sales of Sky and Telescope went through the roof and it was because you know the public was interested in it uh, and picked up the magazine on the newsstand. So I spent uh, 22 years at Sky and Telescope. And while I, no, go ahead, thank you, next, next slide. Uh, among the things I did while I was there was get involved in um, eclipse tours. Uh, Sky and Telescope would advertise an eclipse tour in the magazine and then uh, hundreds of readers would sign up to travel with us either by, you know, for a land tour or for a cruise um, to go see a total solar eclipse, which if you're familiar with total solar eclipses, you know, uh, can only be seen from a very small uh, part of Earth's surface. So in this case, this was my first eclipse, uh, 1991, July uh, in Baja, Mexico. Um, when, when we advise people what they should do for their first total solar eclipse, we usually say, don't try to take any pictures, just look at it, it'll blow your mind. Um, so that's what I did. You see, I had my binoculars there. Um, and the picture here on the left was taken by one of the other tour leaders on this particular Sky and Telescope tour, Fred Espinac, who if you follow eclipses, you know, um, goes by the moniker Mystery Eclipse uh, and ran NASA's solar eclipse website for many, many years. You can see that running an eclipse tour is very hard work, uh, but you know, somebody has to do it. So I'm glad I got the chance. Um, if you go on to the next slide, uh, another thing I did while I was um, at Sky and Telescope was decide that I really needed to get uh, a, my own dark sky observatory. Um, so in 2000, the same year that I uh, took over as editor in chief of the magazine, um, 
I, uh, my wife and I bought a small piece of land in Danbury, New Hampshire, which is uh, just one town away from where I am now in Grafton. Um, and we put up a small cabin, uh, just uh, sort of a three season cabin or maybe two and a half sort of late spring to early fall. Uh, and I built with my own two hands, uh, a roll off roof observatory. And you can see on the right, the roof is rolled back and I've got my big 14 inch telescope in there. Um, and I was really proud of this thing because uh, uh, I, in those days, you couldn't, you couldn't get anybody to build you an observatory. There was no contractor who would do it. There was no company that would do it. Um, so you, you basically had to do it yourself. And that's what I did. I took a garden shed kit um, and I modified it. Um, you know, I, several of my colleagues at Sky and Telescope had built their own observatories and I just, you know, took advantage of their expertise. Um, but I built the whole thing with my own two hands, which was really cool. And the roof just rolled off manually uh, and exposed the telescope to the sky and uh, spent many, many happy years there. So next slide. Oh, yes, I wanted to point out the most unusual coincidence, which I did not know about until, um, until I'd been there for like 15 years, was that um, the founding editor of Sky and Telescope, Charlie Federer, had a summer place in Danbury, New Hampshire. What a coincidence. Two of, by, of a, up to that point, the five editors of Sky and Telescope had a place in Danbury. Well, after 22 years at Sky and Telescope, I got pretty tired of the monthly grind. And I decided to uh, look for another opportunity. I'd been there and I felt like I'd done everything I could do at Sky and Telescope. So I managed to get a teaching position at Phillips Academy, which is a small private high school uh, in Massachusetts, Andover. Um, and uh, part of the reason I took the position, if you click on the, uh, if you click again, is you'll see that uh, there's an observatory on the roof of the Science Center. And they had a nice 16 inch uh, professional quality telescope there. And my job would be to teach astronomy and to do uh, research projects with the students. Um, and they, um, uh, they gave me a one-year position that was uh, extendable for a total of three years. Um, so I dug in, figuring I'd hopefully be there for three years, uh, teaching astronomy to very bright uh, high school students at this wonderful pastoral residential campus. Um, they have uh, all the faculty live there, so they, they uh, provided a house for us and everything. It was really, really wonderful. Uh, next slide. Um, so I was there during the academic year 2008-2009, and in 2009, the International Astronomical Union, which is uh, like the American Astronomical Society, a professional association, but it's worldwide rather than just in one country, uh, it um, convinced the United Nations to declare 2009 the International Year of Astronomy, reason being it was the 400th anniversary of Galileo's um, introduction of the telescope to astronomy. And so um, at an IAU meeting in uh, a few years earlier in 2006, uh, the question came up, uh, what should we do uh, to celebrate the International Year of Astronomy? And I stood up and I said, well, the most obvious thing uh, is that we should give as many people as possible their first look through an astronomical telescope. And everybody agreed that the only way to do that was to, to, to somehow put together a really good um, telescope that could be sold very, very inexpensively so that it could be sold all around the world, including to uh, countries that can't afford to buy a typical uh, amateur astronomer's telescope. So the next slide uh, is the me and my big mouth slide. Um, they put me in charge of developing the Galileo Scope Educational Telescope Kit, which uh, we, we were trying to bring in for under $10, uh, which was, um, it turned out to be impossible. We were able to, to sell it at uh, $12.50 in bulk, and we were able to sell it for $15 to $20 uh, individually. Nevertheless, uh, we managed uh, to distribute during 2009, um, more than 100,000 of these telescopes to more than 100 countries. And over the subsequent 10 years, uh, we distributed another 150,000 plus so that the total number of Galileo scope kits out there is more than a quarter of a million. Uh, and this was a project that I came up with. I came up with the concept. The person in the middle of the photo at the top is my partner, Doug Arian, who um, 
uh, is another astronomer uh, who happens to also be involved in entrepreneurship and he knew how to get such a thing manufactured and distributed. And the guy on the left, Steve Pompey, uh, used to work at, at uh, Kitt Peak National Observatory. He was the head of their science education team um, and he was instrumental in helping us get this project going too. So that was uh, sort of my single biggest public outreach project ever was uh, designing, developing, manufacturing and distributing uh, this very inexpensive telescope kit that's been used in a lot of uh, school settings, planetariums, science museums, and you know, even, even some individual um, stargazers are using them regularly. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with that. Rick, so, may I uh, say something here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so Tamika Marshall here from the YouTube audience, and I just want to say thank you to everyone who is who are joining us today, and for those of you posting in the chat. Um, just a, a quick question, Rick, about the Galileo scopes. Mm -hmm. It is fantastic to know that you were a part of this development. I have personally used Galileo scopes in classrooms with students. Um, it's very approachable and yes, in uh, it, it's an approachable price, not too expensive um, so that classroom teachers and, and others can have them for the students to use. Um, and so the question here is, as you, you and your team were working on developing the Galileo scopes and trying to work with the prices, was there um, any schools or uh, classrooms that you worked with to kind of do testing to see uh, if what you were creating would be well received? Because it really is fantastic. Uh, that was one of Steve Pompey's roles. Um, as the science education head at, uh, at Kitt Peak, um, he had done, uh, he had developed an optics kit uh, that he had tested. He had a program called Hands-On Optics. Uh, and he, uh, he made sure that we designed the Galileo scope so that it could be used uh, with that project. And so a lot of the exercises, uh, we uh, produced a, uh, an education, uh, basically an education pamphlet to go with it that describes a bunch of activities you can do. Um, and uh, most of those were derived from hands-on optics. So these were uh, exercises that had been field tested, um, evaluated, and so on. Um, and so, yeah, the answer is we, well, we didn't work with individual teachers or, or classrooms. We worked with Steve uh, and Rob Sparks, who had done this kind of stuff uh, already, had several, you know, had a decade's worth of experience with it already. Ah, oh, fantastic. And yes, our colleague, Robert Sparks, who uh, definitely uh, is uh, hosting the Live Room NORLAB at, uh, at Tucson. Okay, wow. That is yeah. really good to know. Galileo Scopes has really made having telescopes very approachable to, to so many. It's much more accessible. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And again, in the chat, we are um, open to having comments and questions for Rick uh, at any time. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Jamaica. Yeah, I should mention too that, um, you know, uh, Steve uh, got out of the project uh, after the International Year of Astronomy. Uh, Doug Arian and I kept it going. We, we thought we were going to do this for a year, um, but the education community especially uh, kept telling us, you know, we, we, need, um, we, we need this thing to stay in production. Uh, so Doug and I kept, you know, we just kept taking all the proceeds from the sales and churning it back in. Um, and so over that decade, when we sold a quarter of a million of these things, uh, we never made any money, which was fine because we never intended to make any money, but, but we were able to keep the project going. But by the end of the 10 years, we were both pretty exhausted because, you know, we both were working full time. We were doing this on the side. We weren't getting paid. Um, and we had at that point pretty much run out of inventory and we're not going to be able to afford uh, to produce any more. So we found um, a new partner, Explore Scientific, which is an existing telescope manufacturer that caters to the amateur market and also the science education market. And they agreed uh, to take the project on and keep it going. So you can still get the Galileo scope uh, from Explore Scientific. The price has gone up. It's been a, a lot of years since we did it for you know, 1250. Um, and uh, cost of materials, cost of transportation, all of that's gone up, uh, but you can still get it in bulk. Uh, I think that the bulk educational price is $36 a kit, uh, but from time to time, Explore uh, 
offers it for sale at $25 a kit, which is the price that we sold it at uh, for uh, most of that 10 years. So uh, still available, um, still going strong, um, still selling thousands of them every year, which is just amazing and very gratifying. Okay, next slide. All right, so I told you I was at Phillips Academy in 2008, 2009, and, and two very significant things happened. Uh, the first was the Great Recession, the uh, housing bubble collapsed, Lehman Brothers went out of business, et cetera. Um, and what that meant was that um, private universities like Harvard and private schools like Phillips Academy uh, saw their um, investments tank. Um, and since some of their budget was provided by the interest on their investments and suddenly their investments were worth so much less than they were before, suddenly they couldn't afford to keep this visiting teacher of astronomy. And I was told that at the end of my academic year at Phillips Academy, I wouldn't be able to be renewed. Fortunately, around the same time, the long standing or long serving press officer of the American Astronomical Society, Steve Marin, who I had known for years because I attended a lot of meetings as a reporter from Sky and Telescope, and I knew Steve because he put on the press conferences, um, he retired. And uh, I heard uh, you know, from him and also from his boss, uh, the, the guy who runs the American Astronomical Society, that they were gonna be hiring a replacement. So I arranged to apply for that job um, and I got it. And uh, uh, now I should say that they, they really, they wanted to find somebody who, who was in the mold of Steve Marin, who'd been doing the job for 25 years. So um, I figured if I, if I wore that, that hairpiece, um, I'd be a shoe in. And uh, sure enough, I got the job. So this is us at the handover in uh, January of 2010, which was um, my first meeting as AAS press officer. Um, Steve had just retired. Um, and we were having a, a grand old time. So the American Astronomical Society, as I mentioned, is the uh, professional society of, of astronomers in North America. Uh, we hold two meetings a year, a big one in January and a smaller one in June. Um, and my principal role as press officer is to organize and run press conferences at our meetings. So this first photo here, this is a press conference in 2010. Um, this is sort of the old style where we would get uh, crammed into the corner of some room. Um, we had a slide projector um, and a typical panel of uh, experts was uh, four white guys. Um, so that, that's kind of, uh, you know, how things started for me when I, when I took the job in 2010. Um, the next slide shows a press conference 10 years later. Um, we'd upgraded our technology. We'd upgraded um, our backdrop. We had uh, a lot more um, interest from the press. We had, you know, bigger rooms. Uh, we did webcasting so that press who couldn't, uh, couldn't travel to the meetings could still participate in the press conferences remotely. Um, we, were, we were ahead of Zoom uh, in that regard. Um, and it's been really, really a great uh, experience because um, basically I go through all of the material that's gonna be presented at the meeting and I find the stuff that's the most exciting, the most newsworthy, and I arrange for the presenters to come and, and speak to the assembled media at a press conference. So, uh, you know, I get the cream of the crop. All the best stuff that's happening at a AAS meeting uh, happens uh, right there in the press conferences. Um, arrayed before my, me is uh, the press corps that covers astronomy. This was my opportunity to really get to know uh, science writers not just the ones who work for newspapers, magazines, websites, blogs, et cetera, but also the public information officers um, like Peter Michaud um, and others at uh, observatories, universities, uh, national labs, who uh, put out the press releases that drive a lot of astronomy coverage in the media, that coach their scientists to give really good press conference presentations. So here I was at the intersection of the professional astronomical community and the, uh, the community of journalists, the community of public information officers, and ultimately, um, you know, the reward for, for all of this work was we would see the clippings. Uh, in the old days, it was paper clippings. Now it's, you know, just online, but you'd see all the wonderful stories that were coming out of the meeting about all the interesting discoveries. So, uh, you know, I've gotten to work with 
um, Nobel Prize winners, and I've gotten to work with astronauts, I've gotten to work with, you know, the best minds in our field, and it's just been uh, an extraordinarily gratifying um, experience, uh, especially since it's all about sharing it with uh, journalists and the public. And so um, I feel like, you know, I've been at the center of pushing out all this great uh, astronomy news for more than a decade. Uh, another thing that I did for many years, but I'm no longer doing, was uh, distributing press releases from all over the world in astronomy. Um, this is something Steve Marin started when he was the AAS press officer. Um, it's really not something we need to do anymore because there are a whole bunch of different commercial services that distribute uh, scientific press releases. So we recently stopped doing it. Um, it, it used to take uh, an inordinate amount of my time and I'm glad not to have to do it anymore. Um, it gives me more time uh, to uh, plan for the next meeting uh, without uh, you know, freaking out about how, uh, how much else I have to do. And also uh, gives me uh, more, more of a chance to uh, field queries from the press who are constantly calling up uh, to ask for referrals to astronomers to talk about uh, new, new results that are gonna be appearing in the media and so on. All right, next slide. Okay, so here's another one of these places where my past circles back to my present. Um, one of the things that the American Astronomical Society does is give out awards. Um, and one of its most prestigious awards is the Henry Norris Russell Lecture, uh, which is basically a, uh, a, uh, a prize to an astronomer who has had uh, just a, a very eminent career. And the recipient in 2017 was my old thesis advisor, Giovanni Fazio. Uh, which was uh, very gratifying, very exciting. Um, Giovanni, it, it turns out, here's another weird coincidence. He was born um, one day, uh, it's either before or after my own dad, uh, but you know they're exactly the same age. Um, and Giovanni really was, uh, he's still around too. Uh, he, he was like a second father to me um, when I was in graduate school. He was such a great advisor. Um, and gave me so much encouragement. So it was really wonderful to be in the audience when he picked up that Henry Norris Russell Award uh, and gave his lecture where he talked about the dramatic changes in infrared astronomy that he'd seen in his career. Uh, and at the time, the Spitzer Space Telescope was still operating. Uh, it has since been retired. Uh, but Giovanni has shown no signs of retiring even though he's 87 years old. Next slide. Okay, while I've been at Sky and Telescope, or sorry, while I've been at the American Astronomical Society, I've continued to lead eclipse tours. Um, this is a picture of me at the 2017 eclipse in August in uh, Oregon. Uh, hopefully, uh, many of the people who are watching tonight um, were able to see that eclipse, the one that crossed uh, the United States in uh, August of 2017. Uh, this time, I brought a telescope and a camera and a computer to run it and everything else. Um, and this time I was able to get my own eclipse picture and you can see the result there on the left. Um, I'd, I've been to uh, 14 total solar eclipses, um, but I never got pictures as good as this one because uh, on many of those 14, I was either not taking pictures or I was on a cruise ship. And when you're on a cruise ship, it's rolling and rocking and bouncing and moving. Uh, so it's very hard to get pictures like this uh, where I was using a telescope and a tracking camera. Eclipse tours have taken me all over the world, and um, I've started uh, recently branching out into some other kinds of astro tours. So I recently did a tour uh, in Norway where I cruised up and down the coast of Norway um, across the Arctic Circle and back so that we could see the Aurora Borealis. Now, you remember I was talking about the auroral sounding rocket that I had been involved in as an undergraduate. I never saw an aurora until I got on this trip to Norway just a few years ago. Uh, the woman with me on the left there, we're at the Russian border. That's my wife, Susan. Uh, Susan uh, was uh, the best thing I got besides, uh, even better than my bachelor's degree at Rice was, was uh, finding Susan. Uh, we've been married ever since. Um, and she comes on a lot of these trips with me. Um, so that's my picture of the Aurora Borealis scene from a cruise ship uh, off the coast of Norway. Um, this always evokes to me the, uh, the Starship Enterprise. It looks like the big uh, nacelles as the ship is moving away from us to the lower right. Next slide. I mentioned the IAU, the International Astronomical Union, um, and 
in the aftermath of the International Year of Astronomy, which was hugely successful and involved activities that reached millions of people, um, we, uh, the IAU uh, made permanent a commission uh, called C2, which is uh, communicating astronomy with the public, um, and also created an office for astronomy outreach. And that's um, uh, the emblem or the logo you see there. Uh, we have a conference every two to three years. This is a group photo of our conference in Japan, uh, where our science communicators of all kinds get together. If you uh, click, you'll see uh, I'm in there somewhere. Yeah. And if you click again, you'll see uh, Lars Lindbergh Christensen. He's the uh, uh, leader of the communications, education, and engagement uh, department at NORLAB, and somebody that I've known for many years through our um, our involvement with the IAU. Um, so I've been president of Commission C2 for the last three years. Um, I'm about to rotate off, uh, but we're planning a virtual communicating astronomy with the public conference in late May. Um, and we've got um, almost as many people signed up as you can see in this picture here, which is about 400 people. So this is all about uh, best practices, you know, how you figure out uh, how to communicate science effectively and make sure that you're, um, you're not alienating people, that you're uh, genuinely informing them and that you're uh, meeting them on their own terms, um, respectful of their uh, culture, um, of their of whatever uh, cosmological beliefs they might have and so on. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I also get involved through the AAS with the annual uh, USA, actually it's every other year, I think, USA Science and Engineering Festival. Uh, they had to cancel it this year for obvious reasons, uh, but I was at the last one. Uh, all those balls on the table are for uh, doing uh, scale models of the solar system with kids who come by. Uh, the USA Science and Engineering Festival happens in Washington, D.C., uh, and it attracts hundreds of thousands of uh, families, uh, you know, parents, children, school teachers, classrooms, um, and it's a great opportunity because I get to interact directly with kids, uh, which is not an audience that I get to interact with terribly regularly. Uh, and it's always a lot of fun to see their eyes light up uh, when they learn, you know, the true causes of the seasons, the true causes of the phases of the moon, uh, things like that. Uh, always a lot of fun. Next slide. All right. So uh, in my role at the AAS, I've had several opportunities to uh, cooperate and collaborate with Noir Lab. Uh, here's a, a group photo from a workshop that was held at the Space Telescope Science Institute a couple of years ago, uh, organized by uh, the Gemini Observatory and its program, uh, Gemini in the Era of Multi-Messenger Astronomy. Multi-messenger refers to uh, light, gravitational waves, uh, subatomic particles like neutrinos. Um, and this summit uh, was to uh, try to wrestle with some of the challenges of explaining astronomical discoveries that involve all these different kinds of messengers from the cosmos. Uh, it's hard enough for people to get their hands, their heads around uh, wavelengths of light that are invisible. Uh, and here we are dealing also with, you know, ripples in space time and charged particles that you can't see or feel, but that are coming at you, you know, by the trillions. Um, so that was an interesting summit. Um, the next slide, a couple more things um, that we've collaborated on. Uh, the AAS um, and Noir Lab uh, organized a workshop uh, to try to figure out uh, what these large constellations of communication satellites like the SpaceX Starlink are, are going to mean for astronomy um, and uh, put together a report uh, from a study of, of uh, you know, what the likely impacts are going to be. Uh, there's uh, there's going to be another satellite constellations workshop this summer. Uh, to try to deal with some of the policy implications and try to wrestle with uh, what kinds of regulations might be necessary uh, to enable astronomy from the ground to continue, uh, despite the fact that instead of the uh, currently roughly 2,000 satellites that are in orbit, we suddenly have tens of thousands. They create bright streaks that make it hard for telescopes to see beyond them. And then at the last AAS meeting, uh, the one uh, that we held in January, we had a media workshop on um, multi-messenger astronomy and also its close cousin, time domain astronomy, which is uh, the study of things that change with time, uh, exploding stars, uh, supernova explosions, um, asteroids moving through 
uh, through the solar system, gamma ray bursts and so on. Um, and the, uh, the results of the Gemma workshop that I showed you a group picture of a moment ago uh, were released at that, uh, at that workshop. So it's been fun to collaborate uh, with the uh, public information team, um, science writers from Noir Lab, uh, Gemini, um, and their funding agencies and operations agencies. Um, and I really value the opportunity to, to work with such great people. Next slide. So this is part two of Sky and Telescope. Um, I found out um, from the staff that their uh, parent company, it used to be owned by the employees, but that was a long time ago. Now it, it's been owned by a couple of publishing companies in succession. Um, and it turned out that they were uh, struggling. It wasn't Sky and Telescope that was struggling. It was these big multi-titled publishing companies that were struggling. Um, and it turned out a few months after I heard that they were in trouble, uh, they literally declared bankruptcy. Um, so I came up with this crazy idea. I thought it was crazy that maybe the American Astronomical Society could acquire Sky and Telescope somehow. Um, and it turned out that because it was a bankruptcy auction, um, you know, we were able to afford it. It's nor normally in, in the cutthroat world of commercial publishing, uh, you know, a, a small nonprofit like the AAS would never have been able to acquire a commercial publish publication like Sky and Tell, but we were able to. And then my old uh, teaching supervisor, Owen Gingerich, uh, shown on the right, uh, decided he, he just turned 90 and he's trying to clear out some of his, um, you know, the many possessions that he's acquired over the years, including a complete collection of loose issues of Sky and Telescope. So uh, he invited me to come over and help him box them up. This was right before the pandemic hit. Uh, so we weren't worried about that kind of thing. Um, we spent a whole day boxing up his issues and they're now at, uh, at Sky and Telescope's office. Um, and we'll soon, once the pandemic is over, they'll be shipped down to the AAS office in Washington, DC um, and uh, join uh, the journals published by the, the AAS in the, uh, in the office library. So I'm involved in Sky and Telescope again, uh, which is a great segue to my new observatory. Um, a few years ago, my wife and I decided that uh, we wanted to be able to come up to New Hampshire, not just uh, from late spring to early fall, but, but all around the year. I was especially keen to be able to observe the winter sky. So um, we, we found a property uh, with a big field. Um, it's a, an old 18th century farmhouse with a big field and it's got a perfect spot for an observatory. Uh, this is now 20 years, almost 20 years after I built my first one. And now there was a company I could, I could uh, hire to, to come out and build me an observatory. So I was able to build something much bigger than I could have ever done myself. And as you can see, uh, every telescope I've ever, ever owned uh, my entire 40 odd years in uh, astronomy um, is now available at a moment's notice. I press a button, the roof rolls off. I've got a beautiful dark sky. Um, and all my telescopes get fired up and I can do visual observing, astrophotography and other stuff. Um, the only problem is of course, I'm in New Hampshire. If I were in Tucson or if I were in Hawaii, I'd have an opportunity to observe a lot more often. Um, but when I do get a clear night here, it is absolutely spectacular. It, more so in the winter than any other time uh, because there's so much less water vapor in the air. So that's my new observatory. I call it Williams Hill Observatory because I live on Williams Hill. And you can see the mountains in the background. I have an almost completely unobstructed horizon all the way around, which is great. Next slide. I figured I'd share with you a few astrophotos that I've taken. Um, this is the Andromeda galaxy, the, uh, sort of a twin of our own Milky Way galaxy, two and a half million light years away. It's one of the favorite things to look at because it shows so much uh, detail and uh, is so big. Uh, you could fit about six full moons across it. Um, and there's two little satellite galaxies that are visible there as well. Uh, next slide, a little, uh, this is some stuff, uh, wintertime things, uh, the Orion Nebula on the right and the Horsehead Nebula and the Flame Nebula on the left. You see the Horsehead is that little Horsehead shaped dark cloud that's jutting into the red nebulosity on the left. The Flame Nebula at the top uh, basically uh, looks like what, it, what it's called. Um, and the Orion Nebula on the right is visible um, even in, in small binoculars uh, in the sword of Orion, uh, which is the most prominent constellation of the winter and one of my favorite things to look at. And the next slide is another assortment of pictures. 
It's the moon, which I never tire of looking at and photographing. Um, the uh, top middle real colorful thing is the Dumbbell Nebula, uh, sometimes called the Apple Core Nebula because the bright parts look like an apple core. And then uh, a globular cluster on the bottom, another spiral galaxy on the right, uh, top right, and the Pleiades star cluster on the lower right. Next slide. I've begun to do science again from my observatory. Um, this is a light curve of an asteroid called 9983 Rick Feinberg. I have my own asteroid. So when I was taking pictures of this object, I was essentially uh, looking into the telescope and, and seeing myself, um, an asteroid named after me. Uh, it orbits between Mars and Jupiter in the, uh, in the main asteroid belt. And as you can see, uh, it rotates once every 5.3 hours. So it's a pretty fast rotator. And I'm planning to do more of this kind of work in the future. Next. All right, I'm also involved now with the New Hampshire Astronomical Society. Uh, they invented a library telescope program where um, they raise money to buy these uh, telescopes that they donate to libraries, and then uh, library patrons can check them out like books. Uh, so my wife and I uh, contributed a telescope to our local Grafton library, um, and I've been told that people are checking it out just like books and uh, getting their first telescopic views under our beautiful dark Grafton skies. Next slide. So I announced a couple months ago that I'm going to retire this fall. Um, and I'm really excited about that because it means that I'm going to have a lot more time to do the kind of astronomy that I really enjoy, which is getting out uh, every clear night um, and spending time in my observatory. And I get to pursue some other hobbies and do more travel and not always have to give lectures when I'm traveling and not always have to work. Um, and it will be uh, I will actually, my retirement date is the 12th anniversary of my hire date at the AAS. Uh, so that's a nice round number. And uh, that's it. I'm not gonna disappear, but I'm gonna be uh, enjoying astronomy on my own terms. So that's my career story. It's a nonlinear path um, at the intersections of amateurs, professionals, students, teachers, public, uh, journalists, um, public information officers. Um, and when somebody asks me if I'm a professional or an amateur or a journalist or a public information officer uh, or a student or a teacher, I just say yes. I'm all of those things. Mahalo Nui, Rick, for sharing with us really your, your life story and what an amazing career journey you've had. Very inspiring, I think, for anyone to come back and watch this presentation to learn not only about you, but the different pathways that anyone interested in astronomy can take. Um, and I really just want to say thank you for everything that you've done to contribute to the astronomical field. Um, and I think that you'll continue to contribute from your own home, right? From your own right. little observatory. So amazing. And I'll turn it over now to Jamika for any comments from the chat. Thank you, Leinani, and yes, thank you, Rick. Um, <clears throat> so just in the, in the comments, just um, people appreciating what you were saying and um, acknowledging how beautiful it is from Kit Peak. We have uh, Alan Jackson, one of the people who uh, he's joined us before and I'd yeah. forgotten where he was from, but he did remind me that he's just slightly Northeast of Kit Peak. Um, yes, and so, so fantastic. Uh, I would like to say that I, in the chat, dropped in um, links to the things that you were mentioning. So starting mm -hmm. with the Viking probe all the way uh, to the Science Writers Workshop. Oh, and so I will definitely have uh, those links that you mentioned in your presentation in the video description. So I want to thank everyone who uh, who joined us today. And for those of you who posted your comments and questions, uh, well, your comments uh, in the chat, I think you had a rapturous audience, uh, Rick, and we were definitely in tune. I know I was, I was definitely really loving seeing your home observatory. I've never seen one like quite like yours before. It's a Cadillac for sure. Very much so. And we appreciate you sharing it with us. And, and also really glad to know about your participation in the development of the Galileo scopes. As I've said before, I know mm -hmm. my students that I've had have personally benefited from all of the work that you and your team uh, put into that. So thank you. And over You're to welcome. Peter. Oh, okay. Thank you, uh, Jamika. Uh, Rick, that was excellent. Uh, one of the things that um, 
I, I'm, I'm very, very taken by that picture of the Andromeda galaxy that you showed. And I understand that uh, to do that, you had to go through some uh, pretty uh, intensive work with the dynamic range, the just the intensity of the light and getting it all balanced out. You wanna maybe tell us a little bit more about how you did that? Sure, this is something that um, more and more astrophotographers are doing now. Um, in the old days, if you just uh, you know exposed a piece of film for an hour or something like that, uh, the brighter parts of an object would get blown out and the fainter parts might not show up um, or might just barely show up. Um, so these days what you do is you, you tend to shoot a whole bunch of different exposures, short, medium, and long exposures. And then uh, because everything's digital and you've got uh, image processing software in your computer, you can then stack those to create what most people know of as an HDR image, high dynamic range. So um, your iPhone, for example, uh, can do that automatically. You can shoot a scene that's got bright areas and dark areas. You shoot in HDR mode and the camera takes short, medium and long exposures and combines them uh, to show you the best exposed parts of the scene uh, in a single photo. Uh, in astrophotography, you do much the same thing, only you take the individual exposures, short, medium, and long, you know, anywhere, like for the Orion Nebula, it's anywhere from uh, a second to 10 minutes. Um, and you take lots and lots of pictures and you stack them all together. And the software, um, it's special purpose software that picks out the best exposed parts of each exposure and puts it all together so that you can see everything from the extremely bright nucleus of the galaxy all the way out to the faint outer edges. Nothing's overexposed, nothing's underexposed. It's, it's really nice. That's how that eclipse picture was, was made as well. Uh, so that the, the Andromeda Galaxy image, um, if anyone saw our, our, our preview before we started the show, that was your background image for the flyer. And right. <laughs> excuse me, I did not realize that you developed that image. It is stunning. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. I'm, I'm working on a, a new version of the, of the Orion Nebula that was shot the same way. Um, what I had before was a composite, um, but I didn't go as deep, as long exposures as I've now got. Uh, so one of my upcoming projects is to take all the exposures I shot of the Orion Nebula and put them together into a similarly uh, high dynamic range composite. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Rick Feinberg, American Astronomical Society press secretary coming up on retirement very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate you joining us so much. And let me leave the last word with our host, Leilani Lussi. Mahalo, mahalo Jamika and Peter for being here to ask questions of our amazing guest. And we are over time, but I think I would be remiss not to ask, considering all of the great work that you've done, Rick, um, and all the experiences that you've had, I think that, you know, Sky and Telescope probably inspired many young people and older people, all ages, right, to join what is now very much a growing field of science communication, a very important field, I think, as we would all agree to it being. So do you have any advice for students, people in early career, or maybe who are just thinking about being more involved in science communication or starting a career in science communication, do you have any advice for them? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I belong to the National Association of Science Writers. And when I go to the annual conference, I'm always just amazed at how many people are getting into this field. Um, I think it's because uh, although there's not as much opportunity in you know, the so-called legacy media, newspapers don't have science writers so much, there aren't as many science themed magazines as there used to be. There seems to be a limitless appetite for science content on the internet. Um, and whether it's blogs or, um, you know, or online magazines, um, uh, social media, there's just, there seem to be a growing number of jobs for science communicators. Also, um, the, the importance of science communication, I think can't be overstated. Um, you know, we're seeing now in this country um, and, and in other countries too, you know, um, doubt about the uh, truth of things like climate change, education, the Big Bang Theory, not the TV show, but the actual Big Bang Theory. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, distrust of experts, uh, vaccine hesitancy, all these things that we read about every day. You know, science is a critical part of our life 
and not enough people learn enough about it in school. So there's the opportunity throughout one's life uh, to be educated, informed, and inspired and excited by science. And so science communication is, is where it's at. And one of the things I plan to do in retirement is more of it, you know, more writing, more speaking, uh, more touring and that kind of thing to, to share the wonders of the universe with more people. Awesome. So what I'm hearing as your advice is get involved, and just start building up your experience in yeah. communicating that science. If it's you're a growing field. And, and there's a, a really great community of science writers out there who are very welcoming. Um, yeah, the National Association of Science Writers is a great place to start. Uh, they accept student members. They, have, uh, they publish a book um, on you know, how to get into science writing. Um, and there are, you know, there's so many different, just like there's so many different ways to be an astronomer, there's so many different ways to be a science writer. Well, that's actually really, <laughs> that's really hopeful for those of us who are interested in science writing. And I will definitely add that link to the, you said the National Association of Science Writers? Right, NASW. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will add that link in the video description afterwards. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Rick Feinberg, AAS Press Secretary. Um, Join us next week right here on Live from Noir Lab. We'll be back in Alyssa, I'm sorry, Leinani. Who do we have coming up next? Is it Chile? I believe so, but you know, just follow us on our Noir Lab Astro social media channels. And we of course have Live from Noir Lab every Wednesday at the same time. So please come back, tune in, and we'll have another exciting show for you all. Mahalo Nui to Rick again for joining us. Mahalo Jamika for moderating in the YouTube chat. And mahalo to all of our viewers. With that, 